Now, I just want to go off on a little side track now. Not that it's a side track, it's a major highway, really. And uh, draw your attention to this little chart over here, which talks about the values tree. Everybody in this room, everybody in this country has a value system, everyone. Or, or has a values tree, and it has a root system, a trunk, and fruit. And the root is your theology, the, the trunk is your philosophy, and the fruit is your politics. I'm not talking party politics now. Now, when you look at your theology, the, the, the uh, basic theology we, we talk from a Christian perspective is, is belief in God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible. But uh, there are other theological positions, and I've listed four others. There's agnosticism, atheism, animism, and idolatry. And they are views of God in a negative or positive way. When I, I shared this presentation at uh, my Rotary Club some time ago, and made the statement that uh, an atheist or agnostic is a theologian in the negative. If you make a statement that God doesn't exist, that's the atheist, or if God does exist, you can't get to know him, as the agnostic, you're making a theological statement. And that theological position shapes your philosophy, your value system, the way you see life. And out of that comes the way you care for people. Your politics. Politics is how we care for people. Not party politics, but po politics. And so when you look at, at this values tree and relate it to a nation or to an individual, you come back and say, well, there's an option here. If you don't have the Christian value system, you'll have a pagan value system. What do we mean by pagan? Pagan is basically that group of people who are not Christian, who are not heathen in, this, in the sense that we will define heathen, heathen in a moment, but they're basic, basically religious and I use here Islam and Hindus as, as an expression of, of, of pagan. And um, they understand or know about Christianity, but reject it. And uh, if you look at, at, a, at the, a purely Hindu system or a purely Muslim system and see how their theology expresses itself in philosophy and how it expresses itself in the care of people, it's salutary. You need to do it sometime. And it's, it, it does make you think. Would you want to be a Hindu? Or you, would you want to be a, 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 a Muslim when you see the outcome of their theology and philosophy? And some people obviously say, yes, they would, because millions are. When you come over the other side here to the heathen system, and heathen by definition to, in this presentation is those, that group of people or those groups of people who've never yet heard the gospel. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. They've never heard of the Bible. Now, by and large, the heathen by this definition, are animists. And animists are people who worship the spirit realm. And I use an illustration here, the Australian Aboriginals as an animistic system. The Australian Aboriginals who uh, occupied this land long before whites got here were then, and the mainline Aboriginals who still adhere to their dream time and their, what I call their human myths and legends, because that's what they are, they're not revelation. They're human myths and legends. The dream time is animistic. It's the worship of the spirit world. Now, what you ought to get to grips with is once you get into animism and look at it objectively, there's only two, forms, two, two groups of spirit world occupants, good and evil, no middle ground. And when you look at religion objectively, there's only one spirit called Holy Spirit, and he, he's called Holy Spirit with a definite article, the Holy Spirit. There's not, there's not a lot of Holy Spirits, well, S, there's only one Holy Spirit, capital S, you read all of religion, but there are many other spirits, and other spirits without exception, particularly when you look at, at heathen systems, animistic systems, it's always evil spirits, bad spirits. And the religious structure, if you like, the theology of the animist is a, is a, is a theology of fear got to appease the evil spirits. Do sort of things to keep the bad stuff away from you. And who would want to be in that sort of situation? Now the interesting thing in Australia right now is that the Aboriginal ra radicals, and I'll use that word very carefully, are um, making, getting a lot of television space and a lot of media space in terms of their dream time and their myths and legends. Been taught in schools, you see it on television, and they're getting a religious edge on the Christians. I don't know if anyone's noticed that or not. And, and the interesting th thing is that that sort of license or liberty or freedom hasn't come out of our Judeo-Christian Judeo, uh, Judeo, Judeo background. 
It's come from another source, which I'll come to a little later on. What I want you, want you to understand as a, at this point is that, is that all of us have a value tree. We do have a theology. We, we do have a philosophy. We do have politics. And out of our fruit, the fruit of our tree, there are these institutions and entities, as I call them, that exist. There is, for instance, there is the, um, we start off with the, with the church. I'll go back to the notes that you have here in front of you in the order I have them on the diagram here. Beginning with the family the church, and then education or the school. And you'll notice I've bracketed those three together. And from those three, our children gain their first personal morality understanding. Through the church, through the family, and through the school. That's ideally the place. And then uh, I, I put also in brackets that that's the source where our children get their first understanding of personal economics, attitude towards money, our management of money, earning of money, responsibility. The impact and the influence of the family, the church and the, and the school is so important. And they are, they are basically uh, God-given institutions. It's an environment. The Bible shows that there are three environments which are ideal for the development of the, of the three primary skills of children. There's the family, the church and the school, as you have it there in your diagram. Now, this was revolutionary stuff when I first saw it. It really made me think. It was, it was new thinking to me a few, about 10 or 15 years back. But you see, when you look at it, it's so accurate. You see, the ideal skill for a child to develop in the family is the skill of communication. Parents, mother, mother, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, parents and children, children and children, yet it's so hard to get it going in the family today. That's the ideal environment to, to develop communication skills. Then when you look at the, the church, uh, I wouldn't have picked this one myself. I had to learn this. I, didn't, didn't, I wouldn't have picked it at first. But what's the primary reason for going to church? It's to listen to what God's got to say to you. Where else can you listen to what God's got to say to you? You're too busy at home, too busy at work. And how does God speak? He speaks through the Bible. He speaks through preaching. He speaks through singing hymns. God speaks to us in the house of God. That's one of the primary reasons why, why it's important to go to church. Now, sometimes you mightn't like what you hear. And sometimes you get upset about it, but we need to hear it. The church is for listening. And then the school is to teach children how to reason. Now, the tragedy with our children today is that they're in great turmoil because these three, generally speaking, the average child are in conflict. Just think of your own children. If you sent your children to Sunday school, they had some idea of listening, but they went to school and got a totally different line of thought. And uh, if you sent them to the Sunday school, you may not have been Christian yourself, which is my case. I had a, had a non-Christian father who sent me to Sunday school religiously, emphasized religiously, never went himself. And I'd hear things at Sunday school which I didn't see in my home in terms of my father's lifestyle. When it went to school, another set of rules or conditions. And the confusion that is generated in children because of the conflict between these two, which ideally should, should go together. And it's a part of the, the food of, of our tree, the care of people. Now, when you go up the list, you move into business, politics, government, taxation, or oh, taxation, there's one for you. I haven't got time to go on this tonight, but taxation is a concern. Is it a concern of anybody here? Now, I thought I'd engage the service of an accountant because I thought it would be good information to get. Wouldn't be great to know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good though, it would be depressing to know. But does anybody here know how much tax you pay a year? No, you don't. Well, I asked my tax man, I said, hey, I, said I wonder how much tax I pay. He said, you mean personal tax or company tax? I said, you weren't listening. I know how much I tax I pay full stop, all the hidden stuff. When I buy some petrol, when I get a loaf of bread, when I, when I sort of buy a ream of paper, it's tax, 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 tax. He spent me, sent me 10 pages of stuff which I can't understand. <laughs> and he couldn't find out. He said, what do you want to know that for? I said, I'm having a public meeting on Sunday. I want to tell people about how much thieving is going on on behalf of the tax department. He said, that'll cause an uproar. I said, good, let's have an uproar. <laughs> Now, see, I put it to you. Taxation is a vital responsibility that we have as citizens. We should pay tax, and the government should tax us. But I'll give you a definition there. Notice the word theft. Notice it comes straight after taxation. 
No, I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> but, but there's the definition. Look at taxation. It's con a contribution levied on a person, property or business for the support of the government or to make demands upon. That's what taxation is. <clears throat> now, there are, I would put to you there are legitimate reasons why the government should tax us. And they should take that revenue and do proper things with it. Now, I've got a word, the word thief there. A thief is one who steals especially secretly and without violence. It's taking money of people by stealth. And by that definition, the government is into thieving as well as proper taxing. Now, we don't know the difference. We can't get a handle on it. I put to you, we should find out. And I still don't know. I haven't found anybody. I'm going I'm to ferret this out. I want to know how much time I've got to spend working each year for the government before I get some for me. Would it be three months a year? Would it be six months a year? Well, more than that. We're working six months for the government. Now, I don't mind that if the government's doing the right thing with the money it's taking off me. But I should know how they're taxing me. No one seems to know. If there's anybody here tonight who can put me on the right track and show me where I can find that out, I'd be most uh, appreciative if you would. Now, one of the pieces of paper I did get here was the Australian Institute of Petroleum Limited. Not impressive stuff. But do you know that um, the government revenue from pe for petrol, if the national price of petrol is 73.9 cents a litre, the government slice is, um, is 45 cents? I mean, that's, it's criminal. It's thieving. So, so taxation is, is an important part of our political in, involvement or, or our responsibility or interest. And you go from there up into sort of the media. And you go to, so, to law, and I put two things there, legislation and enforcement. The, the framers of our law. There's some bad people in there. And then the enforcement of law. Are the enforcers of law just simply doing the right thing or manipulating that? to intimidate us or to rip us off. I'm just asking questions. But they impinge upon your life and mine. And then there's health. And I put there sports and recreation and defense and tourism, different things there. And all of these things are, are the issues of our theology, our philosophy and our politics. And uh, they will either move to the right or to the left, which means we might as well get back there and see what we're talking about. And across the top of the... Um, presentation I've got these three words right left and extreme right common words in our language they're in the press all the time he's right or he's left he's middle center or center little or you know can you work it all out now I don't know what they mean I think sometimes they don't what they don't know what they mean but I decided to find out what these words mean and you may be interested to know that the word right in three areas language culture and Bible consistently refer to that which is just absolute truth correct straight or wisdom or reasonable that's what right means it comes down to the notion of righteousness righteousness means to be right living right that by whose standards by our neighbors by the government oh no no by god's standard and god says in his word in proverbs 14 34 that righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people anyone want to see australia great Absolutely. The only way to greatness is through true righteousness. And God has a, a passion and a concern for our nation, which is exciting. He wants us to be righteous people and treat sin as sin. Now, the people who are involved with righteousness, and righteousness, by the way, comes out of the Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian values, are, are persuaded and convinced by theism, Revelation, true godliness, absolute values, correct ethics, virtue, free enterprise, creation, and they believe in principle. Now, that's not, not talking about banks now. I'm talking about principle in terms of that which is, is, is correct. It doesn't change. It's, it's not negotiable. A principled person is a person who's reliable, strong, absolutely straight. And uh, those of us who uh, espouse the Christian position would put ourselves in the righteous camp. Righteousness. And when you go back to the institutions and the entities, if you look at them again, I, I suggest that these can be right, left, or extreme. And in fact, they are one or, or the other of those three. But what's left? 
Now, this is where it gets very uncomfortable. Again, consistently with language, culture, and Bible, the word left. And I looked up a dictionary just to make sure of this, because I got this from another source. I thought, well, I'll go back to the Oxford Dictionary. You check it out. As you come to a definition of a term, there's usually lines of stuff and you sort of various shades of definition. But this is all there. Left means to degenerate, to twist the meaning of, to corrupt, to grow wild, to be sinister, to eat, be evil, and to be a fool, or, or, or to get into folly. That's what the word left means in linguistics, in language, in culture, and in the Bible. Wow, you start talking like this. Now, if, if you look at the right and be consistent and see what comes out of, out of what righteousness stands for and why it is righteous, it comes out of theism, belief in God. You go to the left, and, and what's the main thrust of, of the left? Well, it's there for you to see, and it's very, very clear. It's, it's, it's uncomfortably clear. Atheism, agnosticism, humanism. Now, the atheist is the first that says that there is no God. And I've got a passage of scripture that I would like to put on the screen uh, at, at, in due course. It's a very heavy passage of scripture, and one reads it with a good deal of thoughtfulness from Psalm chapter 14, the first five verses. And it says there in clear language, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have committed abominable deeds, there is no one that does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. That's in the context these people we're talking about. They have all turned aside, together they have become corrupt. There is no one who, who does good, not even one amongst those who say there's no God. Now, you've got to understand scripture. Jesus very strongly warned against calling anybody a fool. To call a man a fool is very dangerous. It's, it's, it's unacceptable because being a fool is such a blight, such a denunciation. One of the few definitions of the fool in the Bible is of the atheist, the one who says there is no God. Now, I'm sure there are many atheists who are what I would say involuntary atheists. They've been sort of, uh, they've become atheists by association, but they're not the hard line, hard nose, what I would call incorrigible atheists. Now, there are some of those in Australia and some in very significant positions who go public, and, and Bill Hayden is one, our Governor General. Adamant in his atheistic position. Bob Hawke, an agnostic. The agnostic says God cannot be known. If he, if he is there, he can't be known. That's a lie. God can be. God has revealed himself to us. Now, I know I'm taking risk mentioning people by names of such, such note in our, in our nation, but we've got to get real. The atheists and the agnostics, the liars and the fools, have been influencing the legal system and the political value system and the culture of our country enormously over the last 10, to 10, 10 or 15 years, longer than the 10 years they've been in government. And it's coming from the left. It, it's it's this, this stuff. Now, the next word I've got there for you is humanism. I haven't got the book to show you tonight, but I encourage you, if you've never read it, there's a book called The Battle for the Mind. It's about the same thickness of this, describing the essence and the objective of humanism in the world today. The humanist, or the humanistic system is basically the religious expression of the atheists and agnostics, who basically say there is no God. If you push that to the ultimate extreme, if there's no God, then there's no accountability. No final accounting of, of what I do. If there's no final uh, a judge or final account that I have to make, I can do what I like. Doesn't matter what I do, I make my own rules. I please myself. And humanism is basically the religious expression of atheism and agnosticism. Now they don't build churches like Christians do, but most of the secular schoolrooms are the chapels for humanism. So I remember reading a statement in a book and it really shook me, but, and I thought about it since, and you know it's true? Most Australians today are practicing humanists. Now, they don't regard them as humanists, but the way they live and their value systems, their ethics, their morals, are humanistic. And Australia is being swayed humanistic to an enormous degree. And we are either going to be a part of that continuing or we're going to do something about helping to remedy it. And then you go down to Darwinism and Marxism, 
and I've linked evolution with, Dar with, with Darwin, of course, and ma socialism with Marxism, and Fabianism. Well, I, I don't know whether you've heard of the Fabian Society, but uh, the Fabian Society was started in, uh, if I got the correct date, uh, 1884, by British socialists. Now, here I am talking about our, our, um, our British traditions, our sort of roots being back in Britain, but there's also some other stuff back in Britain. In 1884, the Fabian Society was formed, a group of socialists who decided not to use bullets, revolution, but to use ballots to change the nation into a socialist system. They've been very good at it. And in, 18, in 1984, they had the centenary. Bob Hawke was the principal speaker. I've got experts on the speech that he gave. It's scary stuff. He said he attributed the success of the Labor Party in no small measure to the effectiveness of the Fabian Society and its principles. Their coat of arms is a wolf in sheep's clothing, overcoming by stealth. They're open, this is, not, this is not mystery religious stuff, this is, you can find this out. And uh, most of the people in the, in the current Labor Party and cabinet are Fabians. You understand this, this is the left. This is where it's coming from. And so out of the left, out of atheism, agnosticism, humanism, Darwinism, evolution, Marxism, socialism comes Fabianism and situational ethics and social engineering or what I call their pragmatism. Changing the situation to suit your purposes or your objective. And so we live in a country, in a, in a, in a, a country called Australia which has a Judeo-Christian rootage and heritage but which is being influenced very heavily over to the left in terms of these institutions. And when you look at the family, or if you look at the church, even the church, now in, going back to uh, chart number 10 or panel number 10, against church I've written the word assembly. That's what the word means. A church is basically an assembly of Christians, yes. But it's, it's, it's natural, it's, it's normal for people to assemble, to associate. And if you look at Australia today, there are all sorts of assemblies going on, gatherings of people who have forsaken the church and what it stands for and are assembling for other reasons. We must assemble somewhere. It's either football or sport or politics or business or immorality of all sorts of things. But, you know, as, as, as free people, we can, we can choose who we assemble with. And God has, has given us the option to assemble with people who love him and his values and to be righteously oriented. All those wholesome things. Now, if we choose not to do that, we move away, and I see they're going to be way to the left, and the left really isn't valid as right is. Left is a departure from the right. You think about that. It is, it is a moving away from values, from, from principle, from, 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 from standards. Now, this is where I need to be very careful. I've mentioned Labor Party people here tonight, and have put them in the left. Does that mean to say that all the Liberals are right? <laughs> Not by a country mile. Some of the biggest crooks this country has seen have, have been Liberal politicians, corrupt, money-grabbing, immoral, irreligious, atheistic. Are all the people in the left politically, the Labor Party, are they, they all totally the dregs? No, there's some fine people there. Some Christian people, godly people over there. Don't know how they got there, but they're over there. <laughs> and I don't know why there's so many crooks in the right. What I'm saying tonight is we're dealing with the essence, we're dealing with basic, we're dealing with fundamentals. There are always exceptions to the rule. But by and large, right means righteousness, left means unrighteousness. Now I'm faced in a situation myself being a righteous man according to the scriptures. There's a man in, in, back in Genesis called Lot whose righteous soul was vexed because of the unholy living amongst the homosexuals of Sodom and Gomorrah. So pressure was put on him. And if you are righteous today, you're going to have pressure put on you. And when pressure is placed upon you, you're going to, move, you're going to either stay put or get pushed one way or the other. Now, I think there's some people today in Australia are facing the problem of they, they, they will not go left under any circumstances, but they could get pushed to the right. And so I give you extreme right. 
or if you like self-righteousness and terms there are fascism, racialism, religiousism, legalism, totalitarianism. Look at the definitions. It's rather curious and, and very salutary and quite disturbing to me that there are people I'm regarded by some. I've had people who are left people politically and morally and ethically introduce me. Here's Bob Payne, the guy who's three steps right of Hitler. And quite serious about it. See, what has happened with the use of words is that people who are politically and theologically and philosophically over the left. When those of us who are right say, hey, it's wrong to be immoral, homosexuality is wrong, we are called extreme right. And that's a lie. And there's this confusion. There's this twisting, this sinister stuff coming from the left, which is atheistic and agnostic. Although I have friends who are both. I, I'm in business with both. I, I, I'm not against them. I'd love to help a socialist left-wing person become rich. <laughs> By becoming a free enterpriser. But it's an enormous change. It's dealing with his theology, his philosophy and his politics. And what I put to you tonight is that, is that we do have a theological basis, we do have a philosophical point of view, and we do have a political responsibility. And is it going to be right, it's going to be left, or it's going to be extreme right? And I look at it myself and, and say, well, what would I do if the law is so changed that it tells me to do things that are totally against what God says in his word? Well, that's not a new situation. Way back in the book of Acts, when the apostles were said, were told, don't you believe or preach in the name of Jesus? And they said, hey, we must obey God before we obey men. And one of the problems with the church today is that so many people in the church are so like the people in the world, you can't tell the difference. So no one's going to get accused of being a Christian because we, don't, we blend in with the crowd so well. But the day is coming with this, with this polarization between the left and the right and the extreme right. that we may have to stand up and be counted before we're much older. And my passion and my concern is that, that Australia remains rooted into its Judeo-Christian values. And the expression of all this in terms of a constitutional monarchy. Does it make any difference whether we become a republic or not? Yes, it makes a monumental difference if you understand history. You see, I look at England today, I go to England as a traveller, I'm like a sort of a second class citizen, it irritates me every time. I go through, got to go through, I've got to go through as one of the rest. The Europeans and all that lot can walk straight through. I'm a colonial. I've got to go through a special chute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm pro-British. Treated like a second half citizen. You look at the monarchy, look at the royal family. If you start looking at the, at the sort of the side issues instead of the principal issue, you'll come to the wrong conclusion. It's not the Queen, it's not Pr Prince Charles, it's not Diana, it's, it's not all this stuff which is the issue, it's, it's what the institution stands for. And it's the protection and the security that we have as a constitutional monarchy that gives us the freedom that, that we have. And the move to change the flag, this is the flag, that's not a foreigner's flag, a foreign power's flag. What does Keating call it? A foreign nation's flag in the corner of ours. That's the three Christian crosses, integral to our history. Patron saint of St. George in England, the patron saint of St. Andrew in Scotland, the patron saint of St. Patrick in Ireland. Going back to the 10th, 10th, 10th century, that, that's our background. When that goes, if, no, sorry, beg your pardon, if it goes, I don't believe it will, but if it goes, I guarantee the people in the left will change it into an animal or a plant and get rid of any semblance of Christianity from our symbol. And that really is serious. It does make a difference. 
And if the flag is changed and we move out from under the benefits of the umbrella of the constitutional monarchy, the Judeo-Christian values, the Queen being the representative of the church, if you like, and if you look at the vows the Queen takes at her, or took at her um, coronation, it's amazing how she's committed herself to Jesus Christ and to the gospel and to the values that have made us free. Should that go, we're over here under some other force, and I would suggest we'll be under the United Nations. And what sort of flag will we have then? It is serious stuff. We need to understand what's happening. The move to change this to that is a pull from the left. And we move from here at our peril, not into freedom, not into liberty, not into truth, into something far more sinister.